it feels like the right thing to do. Even if my head is saying, don't do it. I think my heart is saying that I must. That is a chunk and a half, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I can't believe I'm doing this. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name's Claire and this is Yoli. I make videos all about houseplant care, sharing tips and tricks I've learned over the years to help keep your plants happy and healthy. And today I've got a lot of plant chores to get through. I feel like what just seems to be my life at the moment is that I'm constantly behind with my plant chores. So I feel like this is probably going to be quite a long video. I've got lots of watering and dusting and pest checking and repotting and putting up our propagations and just lots of things to do today. So if you've got stuff to do as well, then feel free to do it along with me and we can do it together. Hopefully it'll be fun. So yes, I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. So because I haven't, because I haven't been home for a while properly, like I haven't had a more than I think half a day at home in what feels like weeks. I feel like my plant chores have just become very tick boxy. Like I'll run in with a watering can and kind of rush around and make sure that nothing's dying. But apart from that, I honestly cannot remember the last time that I just properly got my plants individually, took some time to look over them, deal with any issues that might be there and get them to a healthy state. So weirdly, I'm quite excited for this. I feel like I haven't had a day like this in a while. So yeah, I'm going to start off by just bringing some things over and then I'll just kind of work my way through them. If there's any rehabbing I need to do, then I will be doing that and I will talk you through it as I go. Also, I asked you guys to send in some planty questions and I have had loads from you. So I'm going to aim to get through all of them in this video. As I say, I feel like this is just going to take quite a lot of time as it is and the questions make it more fun and hopefully they will be useful for you guys as well. So yeah, I'm gonna go grab some plants and then we can get started. One of the things that I was gonna talk about is that this is really bizarre. So I noticed mealybugs on my Hoya linearis just before I went away the last time quite badly. And so I decided to chop the plant up and I just thought I'd put some cuttings in water and I'd leave them far away from my other plants while I was away and deal with it when I got back. Just because obviously like propagating a section of the plant then means that if the mother plant doesn't make it, I've got options. And this section, I mean, I kind of scraped off a few, but this section did have quite a lot of mealybugs on before I left. And usually when a plant is more hydrated, that's when the mealybugs love it more because it's more kind of succulent and juicy for them to feed on. But weirdly enough, there's now no mealy bugs on it whatsoever. And I have not treated this plant. Like I've given it a really thorough check over. I've looked in all the nooks and crannies and I don't know where they've gone. And this has never happened before, but I'm hoping that maybe the problem has just fixed itself. I, I mean, that would be a first. It hasn't happened like that in the past. Um, but yeah, I've just got these ones rooting in water at the moment. and they have started to get little roots in them already. So I'm just leaving them be and obviously keeping them far away from other things just in case there is still eggs lurking or anything. But yeah, that would honestly be like the easiest, the easiest pest fix ever if it had worked, but it is still early days and I feel like it's probably too good to be true. It's probably just a fluke at the moment that I'm reading into. But, where should we start? Let's start with my philodendron code 69686. This one is doing, I was going to say, okay, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's doing all right. It's not doing amazingly. I cannot remember the last time its leaves had a dust and they actually don't look as bad on camera, but they are very, very dusty. But since this plant flowered for me, it flowered about six months ago. And since that happened, I have noticed like very strange changes in its growth. Before it was giving me a new leaf kind of every month, every couple of months, it was fairly speedy. And since it's flowered, it's just slowed right down. And in the last six months, I've actually only had one leaf from it. So I think if it does try to flower again, I probably will chop the bloom straight back instead of waiting for the flower to open. But yeah, for now, I think a good hydrate. I've given it a really good pest check actually, and I can't see 
anything to worry about but i'm just gonna get i'm gonna get a damp sponge and i'm gonna just give it a proper wipe over for some of these plants i think just using a microfiber glove is going to be enough but because this one hasn't had a dust in ages i think i think a proper wipe down is in order but if you have if you've clicked on this video then you've probably noticed that i have changed my style of thumbnail and it's kind of weird. I've decided to have like a little bit of a rebrand of my channel just because I've been doing my thumbnails the same way since I pretty much started on YouTube. And although I've become very kind of like attached to the way that I do them, I'm not quite sure nowadays how representative they are of the content that I make. So, so yeah, I've decided to have a bit of a mix up. I've decided to keep things a little bit more casual and not quite so like cartoony and edited because that's that's how I was doing them before and it might not seem like a big deal at all to you guys but it was I don't know why it was a really scary thing for me I think because I've kind of created this image for what I want my channel to be and obviously like I make videos a lot I try to upload three times a week it felt really weird suddenly changing from one thing to the other so I've like gone back and I've remade thumbnails for I think the last like 12 videos or something just so that my brain can kind of adjust but I feel like the way that I was kind of stuck in doing the before was very yeah I've already used the word cartoony but it was very kind of like I don't know like staged I want to say staged and I feel like the majority of the time well I'd hope all of the time my videos are more kind of like natural and chatty and I just didn't think it was working for me anymore and I think sometimes change is good I mean for me because obviously this is now my full-time job it's very easy to get stuck in certain ways of doing things and I think just sometimes completely mixing things up can be quite a healthy decision so yeah it feels a bit bizarre it probably seems completely insignificant to you guys but for me it feels a little bit strange so I just thought I would acknowledge that because I'm aware that my videos no longer look the way that they did before from the outside but yeah apart from that just kind of like a general life update because i know some of you guys were asking in the questions things with me are good i i always kind of don't know i was gonna say i don't know where to start but i also don't know how much there is to say like i've been insanely busy i've been i've been to wales for ross's birthday came back then we went to scotland for the plant swap i was dog sitting for my mum i've kind of been about here there and everywhere a lot but i think the main update with me is just i like i'm good but i feel a bit overwhelmed with everything and i'm happy to be home um as much as i've loved my time away I, i'm definitely i've said this before but i am definitely at heart a real home bird like my happy place is being here with my plants and with yoli and just being able to switch off and be in my own space and do things like this just kind of do gentle plant chores and just not have to go anywhere or do anything so i know that like i do get very easily overly stimulated and i i think it's probably exhausted me more than it would some other people this time away so yeah, I've now actually got a full, a full week where I don't have to go anywhere, which is such an amazing feeling. I cannot, cannot even describe how good that is. Um, but this one's moss pole does need hydrating, but I think I'm going to take that through to the shower shortly and do that then. Um, for now, I'm just going to give it a fertilised through. So I'm just going to prep some fertilised water. So yeah, it's very, very dry, but you can see it does have a really good root system in there. Uh, and this is actually the first time this plant's had a fertiliser in a while because I ran out of fertiliser for about a month. So it always feels very good when you give your plants a fertiliser and you know that they haven't had one for a while. I always just expect like insane growth and I know it's not going to happen overnight, but I feel like I'm doing all the good things. And yeah, I'll just keep monitoring this plant and hopefully she'll start giving me some new growth again soon. As I say, it has really slowed down since the flower, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping now we've got some lovely weather or lots of light at least and long hours of it, she should perk up. But yeah, I'll do an update on her again in a few weeks and see how she's doing. And then my very sad looking philodendron and STI, this one has just dried out so much. And in fact, I think probably 
it's in a pot size that's way too small for it. It has been due for a, an upgrade for quite some time. Um, so I don't actually think I'm going to bother watering this plant now. I think I'll probably just give us leaves a clean over and make sure they're all fine. And I think I'm probably going to repot this plant today just because, yeah, this keeps happening. It's, it's, not, it's not a particularly dramatic philodendron either, but it's obviously just absorbing water very, very quickly and needs more soil. So yeah, for the time being, I'm just going to give it a clean up. Yeah, its leaves are so thin and dehydrated currently. We'll get it into some nice soil shortly. Um, but the first one of your questions was, what advice do you have for plant burnout? And I've had this question before, and it's a really good and really, really valid question. Um, I, I don't know a single plant parent that doesn't struggle with plant burnout from time to time. It is just one of those things. I think with any hobby, it's one of those things. But with something like plant care, obviously, there's there's more consequence in a way if you don't kind of give yourself a bit of a kick up the ass and do it because obviously plants die, whereas something like, I don't know, like model cars are still going to be fine a few a few months later if you do decide to take a break. And to a certain extent, I would say I've got a little bit of plant burnout at the moment. I um, when I when I got back the other day, I walked into this room and I just looked around and I saw loads of dead leaves. I saw a couple of plants that literally looked like they were on the edge of dying, and I found it so overwhelming that I almost didn't know where to start. And it can just be very, very, very disheartening when that happens. And even if you think. Oh my god, my bedroom door just slammed because I've got the doors open and that gave me such a fright. Um, but yes, it can be incredibly disheartening when that happens. And I think for me, plant burnout wise, I what I always try and do is I will try and do things like watch plant chore videos. Like I'll watch Emma's video, I'll watch one of Wild Fern's videos. Like I've got so many planty channels that I absolutely love or even non-planty things. I would just have something on in the background that makes me feel like I'm not in it alone because I think sometimes plant burnout can come from obviously feeling kind of overwhelmed and down about things, but also because plant care is a very, very solo hobby, it can sometimes feel like you're very alone in it and there's nothing to kind of like pull you out and get you going. But I personally often find that although it might take me days, weeks to actually start, once I do start, I kind of sink back into it and I and I fall in love with it again. So. So yeah, if you are struggling with plant burnout, firstly, just know that that's okay. It is normal. It does happen to everyone. Anybody that says that it never happens, I personally don't believe because it's normal and natural. If you are finding it kind of very overwhelming for a long period of time as well, just also remember you don't have to keep your plants. You can, you can pass your plants onto a new home and you can get new plants in your collection when it feels right for you. I think often like, if we look at people with kind of big, amazing collections and kind of think to ourselves, and I am definitely guilty of this as well, and think to ourselves, oh my goodness, I just want my plants to be like that. I want all of these plants. And it can get to a point where it's just too much. Like something that works for some people might not work for other people. And I know I've got a very big collection of house plants, but also this is my full-time job. I do plant stuff all the time. And I know when I was working full-time and I had lots of plants, it was, it was a lot more overwhelming than it is at the moment and even at the moment it has its days so don't ever let that be a pressure in fact I'm gonna chop this leaf because it's yellowing and I don't think that's going to bounce back but yeah just take things slowly be be kind to yourself and also think about some things that you could put in place so that your plant care doesn't have to feel too much like I have recently got a lot of my plants as I keep banging on about into semi hydro just because it does make my life a lot easier. It means that I can just kind of fill their reservoirs and then for not forget about them, but I won't have to be monitoring them as closely as I would some of my plants that are in soil, for example. And it's ju it just makes my life easier. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Like you're allowed to enjoy plant care and appreciate having plants around you, but also do things so that it's not quite so challenging because I mean then if it gets to the point where suddenly your plant care is like amazing and like you're finding it really easy then cool you can get more plants if you want to and if you don't want to then that's fine as well you can take more time to do like experiments with your plants and propagate 
<sighs> okay, right, I'm putting this one to one side for a repot shortly because it definitely needs it. But yeah, that would be that would be my kind of off the top of my head advice on the plant burnout. And find other people in the plant community as well and talk to them about it like i know some of you guys have kind of chatted in the comment section down here there's loads of facebook groups there's obviously a, a massive instagram community as well and i think just normalizing the fact that plant burnout is is a very big thing and like i said when i first started talking about this i think it does just feel a little bit more intense and pressurized when you're talking about plant burnout as opposed to other things just purely because your plants will die if you don't look after them but it shouldn't be a pressure. Plant care is supposed to be fun and enjoyable. And I know for me, like if it was a long period of time and it got to a point where it wasn't anymore, then I would downsize my collection. I would, I would put some things in place so that it wasn't quite so overwhelming for a while. I would say to, I don't know, I, I might put a post on Instagram and say, would anybody like to look after my plant for six months or however long and then I can have it back or I can have a cutting back. There's there's people out there that will do this and the plant community is full of such wonderful people that are so willing to help each other out. I wouldn't assume that that isn't an option um, as well. Like maybe that's not the most, like the best answer I could give, but but yeah, that's, that's my thoughts on plant burnout. And I actually thought um, recently about potentially making a video, and I, I don't know what you guys would think about this, but a video specifically focusing on like those of us that are struggling with plant burnout and need, I guess, like a little bit of a boot up the backside to get going with it. Like, kind of like a plant motivation challenge saying like, for example, right, we are all going to go and find one dusky plant and then we're going to go find one plant that needs repotting and then do kind of like a real time thing together. I don't know if that would be useful. If it would be, then please do let me know down in the comments and I will absolutely make that video because if there's anything that it would help me to get on with plant chores, but if there's anything that I could do to help you guys as well, then that would be that would be amazing. So yeah, do let me know if that's something that you would like me to do. And then the next question was, how do you personally treat fungus gnats? So I have tried so many things over the years for fungus gnats. I know they can be such a pain. There was a point where I had, a, oh my goodness, the worst fungus gnat infestation. They were literally flying everywhere all around my house. It was so embarrassing whenever I had people over because it just, it just looked like there were flies everywhere and I as I say I tried so many things but the main thing that has worked for me in fact two things the first thing is using nematodes nematodes I'm never sure which way you're meant to pronounce it but I get mine from ladybird plant care I'll link it down below and you basically just water them into the soil and they will attack the younger larvae of the fungus gnats and mean that they can't breed and I think the life cycle of a fungus gnat I'm pretty sure is only a few days it's not that long so yeah it does clear the problem up pretty quickly um but obviously fungus gnats breed primarily in damp soil so if you are an overwaterer then that is a problem that you are much more likely to encounter on a regular basis i always i personally have anything i'm an underwaterer i always teach on the side of under as opposed to over um, but the other thing is obviously, again, transferring your plants into semi-hydro. Like I have just said, I've got a lot of my plants into pond, into soil ninja semi-hydro mix. And not only does that make your life easier, it also means that it's a substrate that fungus gnats can't easily breed in. So yeah, I like, whoa, this plant is very side heavy at the moment. Um, but yeah, touch wood. I obviously see the odd one or two. I think if you've got hundreds of plants, you're never going to completely eradicate them. But it's very rare that I see a fungus gnat nowadays since I've been doing things that way. So yeah, that's what I would personally recommend. And mosquito bits as well. They can work really well. I have used them before, but they're not... For, for me, I just prefer nematodes. There's no particular reason. I just do prefer them. Um, I'm also just going to take off the... Um, caterpillars from this plant just because I know they're going to die back anyway and in fact I feel like oh this is interesting so a while ago I said that I never noticed pronounced caterpillars on the philodendron silver sword I said that in a video and I'm just looking at a younger one I've got here and you can't see pronounced caterpillars on this one however since this one has sized up caterpillars 
I find that interesting because some of you were saying that you did have them and others were saying that you didn't. So that makes sense. Maybe it's a maturity thing. Maybe it does just come with the age of the plant. Um, these are two that, again, I am at some point going to pop together as well. Should I do that today? Shall I do that today? No, I think I'm going to wait until I've got this one onto a moss pole before I add the new section. As you can see, this plant is desperately in need of a moss pole. It is growing very bizarrely out of the side of its pot because it doesn't have anything to hold it up. And to be honest, I don't mind the look of it like this, but I just know if I want to achieve much kind of fuller, healthier growth and get the plant to size up, then getting it on a moss pole is the best thing to do. And I don't actually have enough wire right now to be able to make a moss pole today, but I will probably be doing that in the next couple of weeks because it's another thing that I keep putting off. I don't know why I keep putting it off because I know that the plant is going to be much happier and healthier for it. But yeah, I think again, and this feeds back into the plant burnout thing, when there's so many things to do at one time, it gets to the point of being overwhelming and then it's almost like you don't know where to start with any of it. Like you'll tick a few things off the list and then you'll look at your list and you'll see there's a million more things. And because obviously plants constantly grow and evolve and change, a week later there might be loads of new stuff to do and then that goes onto the list and then it's just like ah overwhelming so yes i will aim to get that done in the next couple of weeks although there's a part of me that does quite like the look of it like this it feels very kind of wild and jungly and obviously certain types of philodendron are grown as hanging plants even if that's not the best kind of way to grow the plant or how it would naturally grow out of interest do any of you grow the silver sword as a hanging plant I know that would be a pretty hefty hanger, but yeah, I would love to see if you did. <laughs> and another plant that really needs a moss pole is my Philodendron Jose Bueno, and it's giving me the most beautiful growth now, but obviously, again, it's not gonna size up to the size of that beautiful mother leaf, or it's very unlikely that it will without a moss pole. Um, and this is another one that I've currently got growing in semi-hydro. I'm pretty sure, yeah, its reservoir is empty at the moment, so I'm just gonna give that a water and then give its leaves a little bit of a clean up. Um, but the next question was, how do you know the best lighting for each plant? Um, and like, this might sound like a really basic question, but I actually, like, I feel like I am still learning about this myself. Like, obviously, yes, do your research, find out kind of like, for example, if you're dealing with a calathea, like the internet is gonna tell you that it prefers medium to low light, but, I think the best tip I could possibly give on this um, would be to look at the conditions you've got your plant from. Like, for example, if you go to a glass house garden centre and you pick up a plant, even if it is a plant that prefers lower light conditions, typically, if it's been growing in a glass house, then it's going to need slow acclimation to the new conditions you're going to give it. And that literally goes for every single plant. Like, if you had a if you had a succulent that's capable of growing in full sun but it had been used to growing in medium light for the last six months you take it home you put it in full sun then you're going to have issues so i think yes obviously do your research but do take that with a pinch of salt because when you first get a new plant the most important thing is to find out what its previous conditions were and also don't be able, like if you get plants online don't be afraid to ask this stuff as well like i still to this day will ask particularly if i'm getting a very expensive plant or a very unusual or temperamental plant i'll often contact the seller and just say can you tell me a little bit about the conditions that this plant's being kept in because i want to make sure that its adjustment to my home is as easy and as smooth as possible and that i don't have any issues but yeah, obviously look at the natural habitat that your plant comes from, look at kind of like what its natural growing conditions would be. And then over time, as it adjusts to your home, just try to replicate those conditions to the best you possibly can. Obviously, you're not going to get it just right because we don't live in rainforests. We live in houses and I'm in the UK and I have periods of pretty much no light here. <laughs> um, but just do, do your best, do your best. And plants are often way more adaptable than we give them credit for like none of the plants that i have got in my home would ever naturally grow in this environment and although i do have issues from time to time a lot of the time that's down to me and not down to the environment so yeah i would just say slow acclimation is the key and just get to know your plants figure things out slowly do your research that's what i would say
one of you asked what happens to my big pink princess and white princess philodendron uh, so I've still got both of them I've still got both of them in my collection and neither are doing fantastically I will put some clips in so that you can see what they are currently looking like and in fact my white princess I've been kind of talking about maybe chopping up for a while oh should I do it in this video shall I chop her today the thought of that absolutely terrifies me and there's a big part of me that doesn't want to do it but yeah she's just not doing great and to be honest neither of them have adjusted that well to, to my new environment here which perhaps just contradicts the thing I just said about lighting I don't think it purely comes down to lighting I think it's just been a whole host of environmental things and the fact that because they are such massive plants I don't have the massive amount of like I had conservatory space before and all of my plants could get or all of my plants in that room could get very good light I can't keep all of them up against a window and I think yeah it's just really it's taken its toll on both of them and my pink princess although her growth around the bottom a lot of that thank you Yoli a lot of that is giving me issues. The growth that she's actually giving me now at the top, although it is smaller than it was when it was really kind of like huge, it's, I mean, it's still big growth. It still looks lovely, but it is coming out a lot more conditioned and it does look a lot better. So I'm slightly on the fence with my Pink Princess Philodendron. And I've said this for a while. I am, or I have been thinking about potentially rehoming her just because just because firstly, I don't think this environment is what she needs. I know her potential. I know she could be doing better. And also I just do think that she's probably gonna make somebody else happier than she's making me because at the moment I'm not taking the time to appreciate her and kind of, again, doing the tick box thing, kind of watering her, occasionally dusting her. I've been really bad with that. Um, but yeah, I know that she would bring somebody else much more joy than she's bringing me. So it is something on the cards. And I did think about, would I would I chop her up? Would I sell her as cuttings? Would I sell her as a big full plant or give her away? I don't, I don't really, I don't know. I don't, it's not about the money with that plant. I just want to make sure she's going to a good home. Um, but I think I would probably let her go as a big full plant just because Cuttings are very readily available. Also, this one's very floppy. This is my Aglaonema cutlass, and it's very, very, very floppy. Um, but yeah, cuttings are very readily available nowadays. I mean, small plants are also very readily available, but obviously she is such a giant. She's She comes up to about there now. She's way taller than me. Um, so I think I, I, I don't think I'd chop her. I don't think I'd chop her. But yeah, my white princess is one that I do really want to get back to health, so. I'll talk you through that when we when we get to that. Oh my god, okay, right, I'm gonna chop it today. I will. I will, I will chop my white princess today. Um yeah, I'll talk you through that more when we get to her, but it feels like the right thing to do, even if my head is saying don't do it. I think my heart is saying that I must. God, this is a plant that I haven't given a proper wipe over to for a very long time. I did give it a pest check when I first got home. In fact, I gave all of my kitchen plants a pest check and they all looked fine. But this one just is a little bit finicky and it just takes its time. So I'm gonna get this done and then finish off the plants here and then we can move on to some repotting slash chopping up my white princess. The next one was, if you can only keep one Hoya, which one would it be? Ooh. See, I love my Hoyas. I love my Hoyas, but I haven't been as focused on them recently as I have been some other types of plants. Like, I know I've been through phases where I've just been Hoya obsessed, and I am still Hoya obsessed, but I wouldn't say it's quite as strong at the moment. Um, if I, oh, which Hoya would I keep? Oh, I mean, it's an easy one. My Hoya Sarawak, my Hoya Latifolia Sarawak, which in fact is here. She needs a dust and I also need to give her water. But look at her, she's doing so beautifully. And she has also got some little leaves that are starting, starting to do things for me now. So yeah, I, oh, I've got, a, I've got a few that I would, in fact, most of them I would struggle to part with, but I've got a few that I would really, really struggle with. But I think, if I could only keep one, then it would have to be her. 
It would have to be her. She's so magnificent. Funnily enough, one that I, in fact, this is another thing that I need to do. One that I love, but I don't think I'm properly appreciating at the moment is my Hoya Wilbur Graves. And I actually did a very weird thing. I decided to see how it would cope if I was to grow that Hoya on a moss pole because it had some really insane aerial roots. And I was just wondering if that would even be possible. So I've got it on a moss pole at the moment and it hasn't made any difference. So yeah, I think I want to take that off and probably get it onto a trellis. Um, but currently that's a, that was a wish list toy for such a long time and it's not, it's kind of just not doing much for me. So, so yeah, I definitely need to reevaluate how I'm doing things with that one. Um, what about you, person that asked the question, or just you guys in general? If you could only have one Hoyer in your collection, what would it be? Because I know Hoyers are so addictive and there's so many beautiful, diverse varieties. It's really hard to choose just one. What's your top Hoyer? What would your favourite Hoyer be? Because I don't know if my favourite Hoyer... Uh, is it my Latifolia Sarawak? It's my most magnificent and it's the one that I feel proudest of, but I don't know if it's currently actually my favourite. I kind of feel like my Hoya Bellas may be my favourite at the moment, actually. I know it's a much more common Hoya, but it's just giving me such beautiful blooms and it's just such a fast grower. Oh, I don't know. I don't want to part with any of them. It's a tie. Let's just say it's a tie. One of you said the stems of my code 69666 plant are really sticky. Help, I see no pests. Oh, okay, let me grab, where did I just put it? Okay, so I know I've just given this plant a wipe over, but the exact same thing happens with my code 69666. It's, it's not specifically a philodendron thing, but I have found it a lot in philodendrons. It's often something called extra floral nectaries, which are basically, let me see if I can see any. Okay, there's one just there. I don't know how well you're gonna be able to tell on camera. It just looks like a little blob of sap. Um, but extra floral nectaries are basically nectar secreting glands within the plant that have nothing to do with pollination. They don't do, they don't do the plant any harm. They are just very, very sticky. They can also supposedly sometimes be a sign or a symptom of pests because that was just Yoli having a moment. God, I'm so jumpy today. Um, extra floral nectaries, yes, nectar secreting glands, nothing to do with pollination. That's what I was saying. They can sometimes be a symptom of pests because, and I like, I've never actually noticed a clear correlation in this, but I've heard a lot of people say that sometimes the plant will give out extra floral nectar, extra floral nectar, um, in order to attract pests that are on the plant to that section of the plant. The pests will get stuck and it's essentially their way of killing the pest. Uh, which is very clever if that is the case, but yeah, I mean some plants, in fact, this one here, my um, Philodendron Dean McDowell, that one also is very, very susceptible to extra floral nectaries. I've got them all over the back of the leaves. And as I say, it's completely natural, completely normal. It does just mean that plants that are already very susceptible to dust and dirt, just cling on to it. Like if dust gets stuck to extra floral nectaries, then it, it just means you're gonna have to be wiping the plant a lot more frequently. Um, so yeah, nothing to worry about. I say nothing to worry about, obviously make sure that you have pest checks because it can sometimes look like extra floral nectaries when actually it is pests, um, but I'm assuming that you've checked for that already. Uh, so yes, nothing to worry about. And my Philodendron D. McDowell here, this is one of the only plants that I don't take out of its pot to water. So this trough planter does have drainage, but its drainage holes are kind of raised quite far up so basically you'd have to fill the water to about that much before you would before it would drain if that makes sense um so yeah i just try and judge this one just by feeling and touch wood it's always been fine so that is how i continue to do it um but as i just said extra floral nectaries mean that this plant has got incredibly incredibly dusty it is ridiculously dusty right now uh, so yeah, I'm gonna have to give it a very good wipe down, very good water. Um, and then we can move on to some, I was gonna say scary things. My white princess is just in my mind now. Um, but some repotting -y things, I think. I think that's what's next on my list. And the next question is, tell us how you and Ross met and how did your first date go? Um, 
So, me and Ross, we met, we met on Hinge, classic, The we met on the apps, it's not the kind of like, oh, our eyes met across the dance floor kind of romantic thing that you want to say, but it's practical nowadays, isn't it? Um, so yeah, we met on, met on Hinge, um, and our first date, so our first date, we were meant to be meeting somewhere else, but there were train strikes, and he has a car, and I don't currently have a car, so... He very kindly said that he would drive my way. We went for dinner and drinks and we'd been talking for quite a while before we actually met and I told him that I was really into plants and he seemed really intrigued by that so I said that I would bring him a plant cutting to our first date and I completely forgot the plant cutting and then remembered just before we had pudding and I decided to run home and get the plant cutting and I did. Um, got back it was like the restaurant was closing they were asking us to leave and the waitress was standing there waiting for us to pay and I had said that because he'd driven all the way over my way I would get this and he was like no 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 we'll split it and I was like nope I'm getting this I'm getting this I reached into my bag and realized that I didn't have my purse so that was very embarrassing and like I know because it's just like a classic thing that people say like oh no I haven't got my purse you're going to have to get it it sounds like such a line um, fortunately he wanted a second date so all was good but I did feel very bad about that so uh, so yeah that was that was our first date uh, it was very lovely it feels like a long time ago now but no that is that is the story of how we met the next question was what's a rare plant that you would never get um I mean, there's a lot of kind of rare plants nowadays that are very much hyped up that I kind of look at and go, meh, like not for me, I don't really get the hype around it. Um, I think probably one at the moment that people are going pretty crazy over that I just have no interest in is the variegated Raftophora tetrasperma. Um, I know they're cropping up a lot recently and I think they are kind of, as with any plant that's easily propagatable, becoming a lot more easily accessible now. And I, like, don't get me wrong, I love the Raftivore tetrasperma, it's, it's a plant that I absolutely adore, but the variegated one, I just am like, I don't know, like with some plants, I really appreciate their variegation, I think it adds a lot, and I, I, it makes me kind of love the plant more, and with that, I kind of look at it and I go, is it really necessary? Like, does it add anything to the plant for me? And for me personally, it doesn't, so yeah, I... I think they're overpriced and overhyped personally but that is just my opinion um that's an interesting question though do you guys have any plants that are like maybe like really rare desirable wish list plants for a lot of people that you kind of go oof no uh, i find that really interesting obviously like people's choices in plants is so different i mean obviously that's a good thing because otherwise we would all have the same collections but yeah that's one that just doesn't do it for me I'm now struggling to read the questions because I've put all of my plants just that I will have to move them in a minute. But the next one was, how did you get your pink princess to throw off larger leaves? Um, so I have made videos on this before, but I think it's kind of been very obvious since I've, especially since I've moved here, going from one environment to another and noticing the changes in her growth, what was really working and what wasn't. Um, I think the main thing, like the main thing, obviously there's lots, but the main thing was probably light. Um, and obviously in my mum's conservatory, I was absolutely spoiled for light. It was north facing, but it still got very good hours of light all day round. You obviously could use grow lights to achieve like similar conditions likewise, but it's something that I haven't really done for that plant since I've moved here just because I'm trying not to run too many grow lights. I'm trying to save money. Um, but yeah, I think that is probably the main thing. Um, obviously things like getting onto a good moss pole and stuff like that, that's important. However, when I first started getting seriously big seriously big growth with that plant she actually wasn't on a decent moss pole so although it helps i wouldn't say it is absolutely essential um, and there's not many climbing plants that i would say that for actually using a good quality soil mix fertilizing making sure you're striking the right balance with watering um i've banged on about it a million times before but liquid gold leaf is the fertilizer that i use i'm using right now um, it's amazing and I have noticed such incredible changes in my plants since I started using it and I think I've been using it for about a year and a half, two years now, if that's that right? 
about a year and a half, I would say. Um, but yeah, since I've started using that, my plants growth has just been absolutely insane and touch wood they've been far less susceptible to pests again that could be coincidence but i don't think it is i think they are just overall much healthier but yeah i like i for my pink princess i would say exactly the same for my white princess as well i think primarily light was the reason that i was able to get them to size up so dramatically god i just love the leaves of this plant they're just so beautifully pillowy and this one has been such a fast grower as well this is the one that i got i think in january this year from grow tropicals and i think it only had two or three leaves when i first got it and as you can see now it's just insane and she's like constantly putting out new growth to the point that she's actually almost reached the end of the trough planter so i'm gonna have to think about what i do with her next i guess chop and propagate is the obvious option I don't want to chop her I'm in love with the way that she's growing and one of you asked can I split my snake plant um so yes in theory you absolutely can it depends on um it depends on how many sections of growth you've got in there like obviously like you couldn't split one self-heading part without just chopping and propagating let me get a snake plant so I can show you Okay, so I've got two. So this is an example of one that you probably couldn't split because as you can see, all of the growth is coming from one main section. If I was gonna propagate this plant, which actually I am at the moment, I would take a leaf cutting and I would probably put it, my, my method of propagation for this plant is water. I put it into water and it would root from there and then I'd plant it back up and have either an, an, another plant or a fuller plant. What am I saying? You know what I'm saying? That is what I would do for this kind of growth in a snake plant. However, if you've got a snake plant like this, that has got, oh, this one's very dehydrated, um, that's got lots of sections of growth in the soil, then this is very, very easy to do by division. Um, there's a very clear bit just there that you can see. You can see that point is a completely different, essentially a completely different plant to the other ones here. So yeah, you could just literally take that out, detangle the roots a little bit and divide that very easily. Um, so yes, you can split a snake plant if you haven't just got one plant in there, but they're very good at putting up pups, like even the, even the um, I'll put a clip in, but even the one that I'm rooting in water at the moment, I've got a few that I'm rooting in water, but the uh, moonshine one, that one's got a little pup starting to come up and it's essentially making its own new plant similar to the way that alocasia do with corms. So yeah, that was a roundabout answer to the question, but yes, in theory, you can. And I hope that helps. One of you also said, is it normal not to have aircon in the UK? Where I'm from, every house is rented with a unit. Um, yes, it is very common not to have AC in the UK. I mean, I don't think I know anybody that has it that hasn't had to invest in it themselves. Uh, I think because on the whole, although nowadays we do get very, very hot summers, cheers global warming, um, but on the whole, obviously we're not a particularly hot country, so it's not something that is really thought about that much. Um, my flat gets boiling, boiling hot. It's top floor, the building's made of wood. It's literally like an attic, it gets so hot and I don't have any aircon in here. I'm just running fans at the moment. So yeah, that is a very, very normal thing in the UK. Maybe in like, I don't know, maybe in much more modern buildings, it might be incorporated, but like my mum's house doesn't have aircon. None of my friends' places have aircon. Um, yeah, it's just a very normal thing and it can make it a little bit challenging if you do have not just plants, I mean, pets, children, like it can be a little bit of a nightmare in summer months. I think I've judged that about right. There have been occasions where I've got it a little bit wrong and it has overflowed, but I think, I think I could actually do a little bit more. Yeah, unless you get a self-watering trough planter, it can be quite difficult to find troughs with good drainage and ones that work for house plants because this is actually an outdoor plant, trough planter that I've just decorated. I spray painted it and then drew a pretty pattern on it um but i think that should be okay god i am just so oh that's fine so in love with this plant 
Isn't it just beautiful? Okay, I'm gonna leave it there for the time being and I'm going to, it's all that's on my mind now, so I'm gonna bring through my white princess philodendron. Um, in fact, let me just water my Hoya Sarawak because that is one that I do need to do. Water her, give her leaves a wipe down and then I'm gonna bring my white princess through and we can do the chop. And then one of you asked, how have you found not using chemicals for pests? On the whole, fine. Like, as I say, I have got pests in my home at the moment, not severely, but I know that I have got them on certain plants. Um, there's been a few times where I've been very tempted to grab my bottle of Provanto that's still in my cupboard. And I'm not saying that I would never do that. I think if an infestation was to get really, really bad and nothing else was working and it came down to my plants surviving or sticking with the all natural method, I would obviously go in with chemicals. Um, but the only thing that I've really needed to do that's not like a completely, I mean, it's natural, it's not chemical, but um, I have needed to use alcohol on my plants because I've had mealybugs quite a lot recently. Um, mealybug is something that I've never previously struggled with and I don't know what it's been about this year. I've I've, su I've suddenly just started finding them everywhere. Uh, but yeah, that's that's something that I do do for mealybugs only because I haven't found a good natural solution. I know you can use ladybirds, but I don't think, I, I just don't want to be releasing ladybirds into my home unless, unless it got to the point where I literally couldn't do anything else because they fly about a lot and they're not like predatory mites like you would see them. I also know from when I was living in uh, Shepherd's Bush in London, I don't know why, we had a we had a ladybird infestation at one point and I've no idea how it happened. Uh, but we just had ladybirds all around our window that we had single glazing and the windows didn't close properly so all of them were coming into our house and it was horrible. Um, I mean I like ladybirds but I just wouldn't want to live in a contained space with them so that's why I haven't tried that. But on the whole, with using biological pest control, predatory mites, things like horticultural soap, which I've got here, which is brilliant. I think I, I think it's actually made my life a hell of a lot easier. And it's something that I wish I'd start I'd started to do sooner. And obviously your plants are going to be much more resilient and much healthier if you're not constantly spraying them with chemicals. So yeah, I kind of haven't looked back, but if things got bad, then I would obviously go in with something a little bit harsher. But it is just a last, a last resort at the moment. Yeah, I really want this one to start. I want its leaves to start sizing up on the new growth because, oh, it's really hard to show you because she's so tall now. But like, look, it's taking its time. I just want it to do more. But I'm sure once it gets going, it'll be good. Um, but right. The time has come. I'm gonna chop my white princess. I'm gonna just clear a little bit of space and then I'm gonna bring her through. So this is what my white princess is currently looking like. As you can tell, she's not looking great. She's lost a lot of leaves down at the bottom here. The leaves that she has got are very curly. She is quite dehydrated at the moment. But the main thing is look at the size of her leaves towards the top they are just getting smaller and smaller and smaller and although she's giving me a beautiful little half moon leaf there she's getting relatively good light and I'm not quite sure why she's downsizing so much besides just the environmental change so yeah I do think I do think chopping her is probably the best thing to do um, I'll pop the camera down and I'll just give her a pest check <sighs> and then we can do the scary bit So I don't see any pests, uh, but as I say, sometimes just chopping a plant up and starting again is the best way to do things. It does feel like the right decision. It's just a very sad thing to have to do because she was doing so brilliantly before I moved here. But let's just do it. I know I should absolutely be using pruning shears as well, and I know some of you have said this before. I've got them. I don't know where they are. I'm using scissors. The scissors are clean. Let's take some cuts, shall we? Mwah. Also, the internodal spacing on this plant is so finicky, like it's so condensed. I don't know if you can tell. 
But like, look how condensed that is. So yeah, it's going to be a bit challenging. Okay. Right. Okay, I've got, I've got a top cut. That is a thick stem. That's not even the thickest part of it as well. And I'm definitely going to let this callus, like sometimes with certain types of certain types of plant, but certain types of philodendron, I'll just put them straight into a propagation medium. And with this one, I think she's very susceptible to rotting. So I'll probably let her callus until tomorrow. Um, and then this section, I would probably say moss. That does tend to be my go-to for philodendron. I'm not quite sure where I'll keep her. Maybe in my prop zone, because I don't think she's going to fit in my cabinet. Uh, but yeah, oh, okay, this is where the stem gets really thick. Okay, again, lovely cut. Look at that stem. But yeah, there's a little bit of a root on there to get her going. So again, I'm going to let it callous. Maybe I'll try them in different propping mediums, actually. I feel like perlite is jumping out at me. I feel like that might be a good one. Oh, I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> I'm really hoping that once she's rooted again, I'll be able to pot her back up, get her growing, like get her growth sizing up again really nicely, but get her growing as like a really big full plant that's not just one stem. This is one that I currently wouldn't consider getting rid of or swapping or selling just because I love her so much. And again, I've got some very decent roots on this section, which again is absolutely ginormous. That is a chunk and a half, isn't it? <laughs> That's probably crazy. And look at the size of that leaf as well. Isn't that beautiful? If I could get them all back to this stage, I'd be so happy. I can't get over that. Okay, and that's the last leaf cutting. And the rest, I guess, I'll just take as wet sticks and I can pop them into a prop box. Um, again, I'll definitely leave them to callus. Maybe I'll create a purely pure philodendron white princess prop box. And then I can just watch them and monitor them better than if they were in with a load of other things. God, I think that's probably going to be the chunkiest thing I've ever put into a prop box. And this last bit, again, just because the internodal spacing is not that big, um, obviously I'll need to get all of these little bits off before I put it in because it's going to be more susceptible to rot. But I'm kind of thinking I could just put that in as a full chunk and then hopefully it would have lots of new growth points from the same bit. I might give that a go. I've got quite a lot to play with because I've got all of these wet sticks here as well. So yeah, maybe I'll give it a go. I was just clearing some space to do some repotting and Yoli has started bouncing off the walls. So I think I need to get her out for a W now and then I will come back and then we will carry on. Right, so back from the dog walk and on with the plant chores. I think I'm gonna start with my philodendron Ernestii because it's just looking so sad. And I'd like to give it a water as soon as possible. Yeah, I knew the soil would be dry, but that is literally crumbling, crumbling away. Um, but where did I get to question wise? I know I kind of dropped off. I think the last one was how have you found not using chemicals for pests? So the next one is why does my alocasia have a drop of water on its new leaf every morning? Um, this is a really, this can happen again with lots of plants, but this is a very common thing, particularly with alocasia. I get it with mine as well. Um, it happens through a process called guttation, which is basically just your plants naturally releasing water that they don't need. They'll absorb it through their roots and then they will pass it through their leaves and those are the drops that you see. Um, and some people say it can be down to overwatering. I, I personally have never found that. Like, I, like a lot of my alocasia, in fact, 
In fact, all of my allocation now are in PON or semi-hydroponics. And whenever I fill their water reservoirs up, I always see this pretty much every single morning and it's, it's really nothing to worry about. So, oh, interesting, sorry. I've just interrupted myself because this root system actually is a lot smaller than I thought it would be. How bizarre. I mean, that is still a fairly small pot and I guess that's a big chunky moss pole that is taking up the majority of the pot. So I think I am still gonna pot size up, but I was expecting that root system to be huge and it's not. But yeah, that's, that's in answer to your question, that is gutation and it's absolutely nothing to worry about. Uh, so how big shall I size up? feel like this will be, this will be good. Yeah, I think that's a pretty perfect fit for this plant. Um, and again, I'm just going to go in with soil and I didn't bring any soil over to the table. I brought moss, I brought some hydro, I brought more moss, but soil would be useful. God, that cupboard of chaos truly is awful. I um, I don't have any shelves in that cupboard currently and that's where I keep all of my plant stuff and because I haven't got around to getting shelves in it just means that everything is literally piled up in there and obviously I take stuff out of there on a very regular basis so I'll take it like this was right at the bottom I've just pulled out loads of pots and loads of things, past treatments and I've just had to shove it all back in so I will organise that at some point. But yes, right, okay, we have soil. Another question was, are you against fake plants? Um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that I'm against fake plants. Um, in fact, no, I'm definitely not against fake plants. I personally don't have fake plants in my home. I used to, um, before I found out that I liked real plants back in the day. But I think if you love the look of plants, but you don't have the time to dedicate to actually properly look after them, or if you have no interest in plant care, then why not get fake plants? It's a hell of a lot better for the environment and your bank account to get fake plants that are going to last forever, as opposed to continuously having to buy and then replace other plants if you can't look after them or also if you if you really like the look of plants but if you've got a space that doesn't get any natural light at all then then yeah why not stick some fake plants in there i've got absolutely no natural light in my bathroom i have no windows in there when the door's closed it just it gets nothing at all and whenever i walk in there it always just feels very blank and bare because i don't have plants in that area of my house and I know I could probably get some kind of grow light system, but in a bathroom, I don't know how practical that is. And I, d I don't really know. Like, I don't know. I think it would just be easier. It'd be easier if I had a window, but it would probably be easier to put some fake plants in there if I wanted to do that. So yeah, I'm definitely not against, against fake plants. Perfect. So although the plant is still looking incredibly floppy, I'll give it a water through after this and knowing how dramatic this plant can be I would have thought by the morning it will be back to its normal self I know it has got a little bit of yellowing on some of the leaves and obviously in fact that leaf might need to be chopped I don't think that's going to bounce back but on the whole considering I've had a lot of time away from home I think things could be looking worse so I'm going to remain optimistic with that plant um, and then the next thing that I wanted to do is take my Hoya Wilbur Graves off this silly moss pole because it hasn't done anything. The plant hasn't seemed any happier and I would just, I'm kind of thinking, I'm kind of thinking maybe in the same way as if you want to get your pothos plant more full, if I wind it round itself in the soil and kind of pin it in, maybe that will encourage it to grow a little bit fuller and bushier. I've never actually done that with a Hoya before, but in theory it should work. So I think that is what I'm gonna try. Um, but yeah, that's currently what it's looking like on its moss pole. Um, I didn't put it on there that long ago, actually. I think it was only maybe maybe three or four months ago. And really, I think I, sh I should give it a little bit longer if I think that it could work. But I think there's a reason that not more people grow Hoyas on moss poles. And because I don't particularly like the look of it, 
and it doesn't seem to be benefiting the plants in any way, I think, I think I'm going to change it up. And one of you said, I have a black velvet allocasia that needs a repot, but I'm too scared. How do you repot? Um, so, I mean, re repotting a plant in general or specifically allocasia? I mean, allocasia, the thing that you'll probably find or might find when you're repotting allocasia is that you might come across corms in the soil, which is basically the plant trying to, uh, trying to propagate itself. It's essentially putting out little babies and you can take those and you can turn them into other plants. But the key with any repot is just to kind of take things very, very gently, because particularly if it's a fairly immature plant, it really, it depends on the size and the scale of the plant and the root system that it's got. But obviously the younger plant you're working with, the more gentle you want to be because it, its root system likely won't be, this is actually gripping on pretty well, um, but its root system probably won't be that established and the less of a root system it has, the more likely it's going to be to issues if you damage that root system. So just go very, very carefully. If its root system is quite small and fragile, don't worry about getting all of the soil off. You can just kind of leave the root ball a little bit together. I know I break up roots sometimes, but typically with alocasia, unless, unless something's going very, very wrong, I won't mess with the root ball too much. Maybe just kind of give it a bit of a scrunch, allow a little bit of the soil to come away and then pop it into its new pots. Um, and I have said this as well a lot recently, but if you haven't followed my other videos, then I will say it again. I have had so much luck with alocasia in semi-hydro, in either pond or soil ninja semi-hydro mix, and it has just done wonders for my alocasia. So if you have the option to repot into, into semi-hydro, then I would personally really recommend it. It's just encouraged the most wonderful growth in my plants, and I really, really wish I'd done it sooner. So. Yeah, the thing that you have to make sure if you are doing that though, is you need to, contrary to what I just said, you do need to make sure you get pretty much all of the soil off the roots first, because if there is any organic matter left on the roots and then you put it into semi-hydro, it can cause it to start to rot. So yeah, that would be what I would do, but I have got lots of repotting videos on my channel if you're just not sure about repotting in general. I am also repotting a plant right now. Have I got any alocasia I need to repot? I don't think I do. Basically, just don't worry too much about it. I'm sure it'll be absolutely fine. Just be gentle. And once you have repotted, make sure you keep the plant's environment as similar as possible to how it was before. So don't repot your plant and then suddenly decide to put it in a new spot. You want to try and keep the conditions as similar as possible so that it doesn't have to deal with changes to the root system and changes to the environment at the same time, because this can make it go downhill. Um, but also I was going to say, usually I wouldn't reuse soil, but I am going to just take the little bit that I just took out of the Hoya Wilbur Graves pot because as I say, it was brand new soil only a few months ago and I'm just going to mix it in with some of the base mix here. Uh, and somewhere there was a question as well. Um, I, I think the question was basically, how do you, how do you refresh soil? Um, and that kind of implies, I don't know exactly what the person meant by this question, but that kind of implies how, how do you like sterilize your soil? And I've said it before, I don't. I know some people do choose to do this, but with any chemical additives or anything like that that you put into the soil, it will take away a lot of the beneficial microbes. It'll take away a lot of the nutrition from the soil. And also chances are if your plant has been in the same soil mix for a long period of time, then a lot of the nutrition is probably gonna be gone from the soil anyway. So there's obviously some things you can do if you don't have the soil to repot a plant and you want to just add a bit of nutrition in there, you can you can fertilize. Um, but if your plant does need to be repotted, I would very much always recommend that you don't use the same soil again. <laughs> she says reusing the same soil. The only reason I am reusing the soil, as I say, is because it was pretty much brand new and it would just be a shame to throw it away when it still does hold a lot of its nutritional value and it's from the same plant. It's not like I'm spreading things from one plant to another plant. That is the only circumstance in which I personally would say to reuse the same soil. Um, but yeah, like I say, this plant has got some really good aerial roots. So I think I'm going to wind it round in its pot and hope that it roots down in there. And maybe at some point it will be looking a little bit fuller. The other option, of course, with this plant would be to trellis it. And I have thought about that, but I'd like to give this a go first. 
saying that's what I'm going to do. It actually does not want to stay in that position, I think, because I've had it on the multiple uprights for quite a long time. Yeah, it's just unwinding itself. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to take some of these hairpins that I used to attach it to its multiple before. It's just a crocodile clip that I bent open and these are great for planty things. As I say, I used it to fix it to the multiple before and I'm going to just use it now to pin it down into the soil and see if it wants to stay that way. And if it doesn't, we'll think of what else we can do. Perfect. Okay, it doesn't look like the most glamorous thing in the world, but there we go. And I think I'm probably going to put this one into my cabinet. My Hoyas have all responded amazingly in my cabinet. They just, they seem to love the heat and humidity. So I think that is my plan with this one. Um, again, I need to give it a good drink, so I'll put it there to water shortly. Oh, and this is just an update that I was going to give you, because I know a lot of you have been asking about my Pateras Albo Lineata Fern, the one that I almost threw away, I think, back in January. Was it January? It was a while ago. I almost threw it away because it died back within a week of me owning it, and I then chopped it up and I put it in this little like hummus tub container. Oh, what's going on in here? I'm going to give you an update, but it looks like there's something to investigate as well. Um, but this is what it's looking like now. It is growing back. It's growing back fairly slowly, um, but it is doing things. What is all of this? There's lots of black on the leaves, just like there. You see? It's not a lot. It kind of just looks like mud. And I guess it could just be soil. I mean, there's no damage otherwise to the leaves, so I'm going to assume it's not pest related. Yeah, everything looks fine. I think I just panicked because I just assumed that everything is going to go wrong with this plant, but maybe it is just fine. Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I know I said this last time, I know I said I was going to start acclimating it more to normal room humidity and just take this off for a few hours every day. I've been so bad at remembering to do that. I've taken it off maybe four or five times since I said that, and that was months ago. So I will start trying to do that a little bit more. I think I need to put that plant in a spot where I see it more because it's just currently tucked with lots of other plants and I keep forgetting about it. So yeah, I will stay on that and I'll let you know how the acclimation goes. And there's something that I've wanted to do for a really long time, and again, I've been talking about for ages, but I haven't actually got around to doing, is potting up some of my Anthurium clarinervium babies. And these are from the Anthurium that I pollinated myself. And these are the ones that were germinated in the dark. And as you can see, they are doing brilliantly. And they've got a really fantastic root system down there. And I think they're definitely ready to go into whatever the next substrate is. I might try... I might try a couple in soil and I might try a couple in semi-hydro, but I'm not, I'm just going to get out some of the better established ones if I possibly can and try and get the moss off from around their roots. Oh my goodness, it's got such good roots. This makes me so happy. Honestly, I, I think all anthuriums, like anthurium pollination in general does take a while, but Oh my goodness, my the berries on my clarinervium took about nine months before they were ready for harvest. And it just kind of makes it, it makes it worthwhile when things start happening and it just makes you feel like a proud parent. So I'm very happy to see that these are doing so well. Like, look, look at those little roots. I'm so happy, yay. But yeah, right, I'm gonna get a few of them out and then I'll pop them up. Um, so in the meantime, what was the next question? Somebody's asked, can you talk about powdery mildew, please? Um, so it's actually not something I've encountered for a while, but I know most commonly in a home environment, powdery mildew does tend to be caused by circulation, bad air circulation. Obviously, if it's come into contact with another plant with powdery mildew, God, I don't know why that's such a tongue twister. Um, then obviously it, it can also be affected, but as I say, most commonly it is down to air circulation. So if you do have a very humid home, but your circulation's bad, think about maybe investing in a fan, opening windows, things like that. 
Um, and if you want to, in terms of treating it, you can use, if you want to go for kind of like a natural approach, stuff like baking soda is actually brilliant. I've used that before on, again, an Anthurium clarinervium that had it, uh, and it worked really well. Again, velvety leaf plants do tend to be a lot more susceptible to mildew, hence why I often say don't spray their leaves in the same way because it can cause issues. What am I doing? I'm going to pop this up. I was going to get some out first. My brain's not working today. But the other thing that you can do is you can get fungicides in the same way as you get pesticides. And you want to look for, I'm pretty sure this is right and I'll put it on the screen if I make a mistake, um, but copper or sulfate based fungicides. And again, I'm pretty certain that's what I've used in the past. I just get mine off Amazon. But if it's not super severe, as I say, baking soda should do the trick. So yeah, I'm probably not the best person to ask about that because as I say, it hasn't been something that's severely impacts my plant collection at any time but on the occasions that it has those have been the things that have worked for me oh my goodness all of these have such good roots and that one's got three little leaves they don't look like clarinerbiums at all yet bar the little heart-shaped leaves but i'm just so excited to watch them grow and develop it's so exciting like i know it's amazing just with plant care in general to look at a plant and think like if it wasn't for me, that new leaf wouldn't wouldn't have unfurled because I did that, I cared for that plant and I made that happen. But with these little plant babies now, I'm just thinking if I, like a year ago, if I didn't pollinate that anthurium, then I wouldn't have all of these little ones now. Nature's just really amazing, isn't it? It never ceases to amaze me. And the next person said, when did you become so passionate about plants? I'm sure I've spoken about this before, I must have done. Um, I don't think there's been like, a, has there? I was gonna say, I don't think there's been like a clear defining point for me. I've always really liked the look of plants. I spoke earlier about fake plants and how I used to have lots of fake plants. I loved the look of them. Um, and I was really, really bad with real plants. I had an African violet of my nana's that I killed very, very quickly. Um, my mum had a few real plants and I used to kind of sneak them down to my room and try and look after them and not really know what I was doing. I, I just kind of assumed that if, if I was watering them lots, then that was the best way of caring for them. I didn't understand about individual care needs or anything like that. Um, and then just at some point, I just started doing a little bit of research into what plants actually need to survive, what they like, what they don't like, kind of the different types of plants. And then I just got obsessed with it and I couldn't stop reading about it and I couldn't stop learning about it. And there was a little bit of kind of not that much video content on the Internet at this time about caring for plants. Like there weren't many plant YouTubers or anything like that. Um, but any any information I could get hold of, I would, and I just kind of taught myself until I wasn't killing plants anymore, until I was able to start building up my collection quite nicely, and I wasn't having, of course I was still having issues, like it's never without issues, but I was definitely killing less plants, and, um, and yeah, I, I would say the obsession, I mean, when did the obsession start? I think probably about five years ago but I didn't I mean like most people I didn't go kind of crazy crazy until lockdown I think I probably had about 100 plants in my collection prior to lockdown and then when everything closed and everything was online I just thought oh my god well what am I gonna do I'm gonna fuel my hobby and I'm gonna buy loads of plants and that is exactly what I did um also I'm just putting these little ones into semi-hydro so I can monitor their roots nicely there I'm gonna do two a cup just because they're obviously very small at the moment and I can always repot when they start sizing up. And I'm kind of thinking I might do, I might do both of them in semi-hydro just because there's some in here that I'd like to leave in moss for a little bit longer. The ones with a really good root system, I think I want to get into semi-hydro. But yeah, how about you guys? When did, when did your plant obsession start and how did you get into it and how are you finding it? How many plants have you currently got? I feel like I, I built my collection up in the grand scheme of things probably really quite quickly. I know some people would take, I don't know, 10, 15 years to build a 300, I know 300 compared to some people isn't a lot, but it's still a lot of plants. Some people might take years and years and years to do that. And, I went from 100 to 
well over 200 plants in the space of about a year and a half I think and I mean that's that's pretty crazy and if I could go back and I could do things a little bit differently I think I might have slowed down slightly obviously I did have the time at that point because we were in lockdown to kind of really get to know my plants very well but under normal circumstances I think I would advise my earlier self to just slow down and get to know my plants really well before bringing in too many more to my collection because I think especially when you're relatively new to plants there's nothing worse than when they all start going downhill and it can be so ridiculously overwhelming and I'm sure for a lot of people kind of put them off plant care a little bit um, so yeah, take things slow, get to know your plants, get to know what they like, what they don't like, focus on achieving the best possible growth in them and when you feel like you're really comfortable with that and you don't have to think too much about it, you can just respond to them, then go ahead and bring more plants into your collection. That's a very hypocritical thing to say because I have not always done that, but that is what I would personally, personally advise. But yeah, there, I've got four of the little babies potted up. And again, I will fill their reservoirs after I finish filming this. I'm going to take the risk and put them down there, even though Yoli may knock them. And then the rest of them in here, I'm just going to leave, because these are the kind of slightly younger ones. I'm going to just leave them for, I don't know, maybe another few weeks and see how they get on. They are perfectly happy in here. I think this is the point now where I could start to fertilise this moss and I could add a little bit of nutrition in there and that would probably get them going a little bit better. So yeah, next time I rehydrate the moss, I think I will do that and then I will pop them up again at some point. But then I just thought as well, this is something that I've been meaning to do for ages and have not done. It's not like a pressing, urgent thing, but I just thought I'd have a look into my, my biggest prop box and just see what was going on in there and see if there was anything I mean, I'm confident there is stuff that could be potted up, but see if there's anything that kind of jumped out at me to be potted. Oh yeah, there's lots going on in here. Look at that. Wow. I can see some gorgeous gloriosums in there. The thing that I think I would like to take out and pot up is the Philodendron varicosum. I think I've got a few sections of that in here. Just because I've never really had much luck with the varicosum in the past and I've so desperately wanted it to be a plant that works for me because I see it in other people's collections and I think it is just the most beautiful thing in the world but it is uh, because it's essentially like a pure a purebred plant it's not a hybrid it can be a lot more susceptible to pests and disease and every single time I've had a gloriosum it's ended up getting either thrips or spider mites Hence why I have chopped it up and propagated it so many times. Oh my goodness, I don't really know how I can show you, but it's kind of taking half the prop box with it because it's so well rooted in there. Okay. I finally got it out and it is so beautiful, but I am going to need to do quite a bit of untangling. And in fact, I could get it onto the little moss pole that I just took my Hoya Wilbur Greaves off. I think that would work quite well. Um, I've got a couple of sections of Ericosum in here actually, so I'm going to try and get the other little bit out if I can without destroying the roots. Oh, there's another little bit. Yeah, and now I've got another teeny tiny bit there as well. Okay, so I feel like this is going to be like quick, for, well not quick fire, but like get through a lot of questions now because I've got a lot, a lot of moss to get off these roots. I feel like I'm going to regret giving myself this job. It does seem to be pulling away fairly easily, but this can just get so tedious, especially with certain types of philodendron like the varicosum. Their root system is quite spindly until it becomes a little bit more well established and it's just so finicky. So yes, let's go on to another question. One of you said, I bought a dubia cutting. Do I put it straight onto a D-shaped moss pole or try to root it first? Um, it depends really how you're thinking of rooting it. Like if you're rooting it in moss, then you could absolutely put it on a, put it on a moss pole at the same time. Um, obviously, if you're rooting it in water, it's going to be quite difficult to put it on a moss pole. Uh, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't recommend rooting it in soil just because I've never had any luck doing it that way. 
if it was my cutting, I think what I would probably do, probably, probably get it into like a moss propagation box and lie it flat. And then when it starts to root down, hopefully from all of, all of the areas you want it to root from, then you essentially start good aerial roots going into moss that then you can take and put into a moss pole, if that makes sense. Does that, did I explain that well? So for example, if you create a little moss propagation box like I've done there, and you put your cutting in there, and as it starts to root down, then you'll essentially get the root system that you would have got in a moss pole, as well as the main roots that you then put up into the soil. So when you take it out, you can just take it out as one and put that section of moss into a moss pole, and it's kind of already on a pole. Oh, I know what I mean by that, but I'm not confident that that was a clear explanation at all. I'm hoping when I watch this back, it will be clear. If it wasn't, uh, personally, I would say don't worry about the moss pole for now. And if it was my cutting, depending on, depending on what stage it's at, I would probably opt for moss propagation. Um, yeah, wow, that's what I'm saying. I think my brain is going to sleep. I think I need to take a break from plant things. <laughs> There's so much to do and I am determined to finish all of these questions as well. It's good, it's keeping me motivated and it's keeping me focused on what I need to do and I'm guessing through a lot. If you guys are doing plant chores as well, then I hope yours are going well. How are you getting on? How are your plants doing? <laughs> Someone said, how do you think plants have helped with your mental health? I'm struggling and just starting to get into plants. Oh my goodness, I have spoken about this so many times before. Plants, for me, are like the biggest, the, the, the most amazing support mental health wise. And I've said it so many times again, but something I so wish I'd known about sooner in my life. Um, I think on a daily basis nowadays, I, I've, I've said before, I struggle with anxiety. I'm having a period where it's not quite so bad, but it still is, I still have like bouts of anxiety almost almost every single day like in small doses and usually if I am feeling angsty or if I'm feeling low then coming through and spending time with my plants or doing something as simple as what I'm doing now just repotting or something that kind of really forces me to look at what's in front of me it, it, it's just amazing it's so like I know it sounds so kind of like ugh, to use the word but it's it's so healing it really is so healing I think looking after any living thing can be incredibly healing, but with plants, there's also a lot of the time a big sense of achievement because you can look at a new leaf and you can think, wow, I did that. Like I was just saying about my clarinervium seeds, that gives me such a sense of achievement. It makes me go, oh my goodness, if it wasn't for me, this wouldn't have happened. And I'm not saying that they are the ultimate fix. And I'm not saying that if you're really struggling mental health wise, you shouldn't go and seek other support. I 100% think that you probably should. I certainly did. Um, but I think they are just a really wonderful way of connecting you with nature, grounding you in yourself and just kind of bringing you back down sometimes when you need to be brought back into your body. Um, I know for me, and again, I've touched on this before, but I know that I have got an incredibly addictive personality. Fortunately, nowadays, my addiction is plants. I think that's a very good thing. Um, but it has meant that there's been times in my life where there's been lots of other kind of very unhealthy coping mechanisms that I've had that that I think if, if maybe I'd known about something such as plants that gives me such a buzz, that gives me such a fix in a healthier way, if I'd known about that sooner, then maybe, who knows, maybe there would have been other things in my life that I didn't, I didn't lean on so much. Yeah, plants are amazing. They really are. And it, there's, there's no coincidence that like every single person you speak to, whether they're a gardener, whether they're a houseplant fanatic, whether they just grow seeds in their, in their greenhouse, like whenever you start talking about the benefits of plants and your mental health and the fact that they are kind of like a natural mood lifter a lot of the time, I don't think I've met a single person that hasn't gone, oh my God, yes, I completely get that. It's, it's not just like, it's not just me being weird. I'm sure most of us here can relate to the fact that plants are amazing for your mental health especially in the world that we live in nowadays where everything is so technology based and we're staring at screens so much of the time it's just 
it's a wonderful way of bringing you back to nature. I mean, if you can't, if you can't get outside, if you don't have a garden, if you can't go for walks all the time, tuning into nature is, is just, it's how we're meant to be, isn't it? And I often find it funny because I like, for me, obviously plants getting away from, like I just said, away from technology and stuff like that. Um, it kind of sometimes feels a bit counter counterintuitive is that the right word but the fact that i do youtube because obviously that is like very much technology editing like all that sort of stuff i try not to do too many like heavy edit videos but it kind of goes away from everything i was just talking about but at the same time it allows me to connect with you guys connect with a wonderful wonderful community of people that share a passion for the same thing and be able to talk about that and express that and have these kind of conversations like I can guarantee you guys will be talking about stuff in the comments and like when I see the comments in my videos it makes me so happy to think that like that's I was gonna say I've started a conversation but I haven't like this was your question whoever asked this so you have started this conversation that's been facilitated here and now it's it kind of just opens it up and I just think that's that's so amazing and that's why I always say I don't think of for me I don't think of YouTube as social media I hear social media and I hear Instagram Facebook TikTok all that sort of stuff and I am so not active on those platforms I have a jungle haven Instagram page that I will occasionally post on like I post on there sometimes like once a month nowadays and I know that this is my this is my business and technically I should be kind of promoting on different platforms but this is the platform that I love and I would much prefer to give my focus to this and my community here and do chatty updates like this instead of everything in kind of I don't know technological photo form the whole time I don't know if that makes sense I don't know if I'm just waffling but that's how I feel and that's why I think plants are amazing for your mental health. End of question. <laughs> okay, I haven't got all of the moss off this bit, but I think I've got enough off to be able to pot it up. I don't think that's gonna cause rot. It's just so hard to tell what's moss and what's root. So I think that's the best I can do. I've got one more to go here. What is your number one wish list plant at the moment? Oh, this is tricky. I'm trying not to give that too much energy because I'm desperately trying not to buy more plants at the moment. I, as I say, my collection is just not on top of as it is. I've got so much stuff to do. So I'm trying not to buy any more plants. However, if I had to pick a top wish list plant, oh, I've got two very clear ones in my mind. I'm trying to think of what the top one would be. Okay, my two that spring to mind immediately are Anthurium pallidiflorum, which I just love, I adore. I will put a picture of it on the screen there because I really, really want one and I've wanted one for such a long time. Um, but then also the Piper SP Thailand Silver, and that's the one that I spoke about it in my Wishless Plants video, I think about three months ago. And that's one that I've only ever seen on the Grow Tropicals website. I've never seen it anywhere else. I have searched for it elsewhere and I can't find it. Um, but that one feels more unattainable. Um, the Palette of Florum, although it is still quite hard to come by, I feel like it's more likely to be able to get hold of. Uh, but if I had to say, if I had to say just one, I think, I think I probably would go Anthurium Palette of Florum. I just think it's gorgeous. I'm constantly looking at pictures of it, and whenever I start doing that with the plants, I know it's one that. I'm gonna have to have like before I got my Viannum for like a year in fact I got a Viannum a couple of years ago and then it all went wrong um but I had been looking at pictures of that plant for such a long time and I'd been imagining it in my collection and what it would be like to own it it's kind of sod's law that it's given me a lot of grief in the time that I've had it but I feel like we're starting to turn a corner now but no the Palladiflora would be my number one closely followed by the Pi Press P Thailand Silver. Um, what about you? What about you guys? What would be your number one wish list plant at the moment? Or, okay, let's say two. I gave you two. What are your top two wish list plants currently? And is anyone else trying not to buy more plants at the moment? Trying to be good and get on top of the ones that you've got? Or is that just me? I give into temptation so easily, it's ridiculous. I was gonna say I'm doing well, but it has just been the plant swap and I did get more plants at the plant swap. I haven't bought any plants for myself 
since I got the rare plant recipe box, which I think was a couple of months ago, which isn't bad going, I wouldn't say. I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's bad. It's not bad. No. <laughs> okay, let's pot up the plant. Okay, I think we're going to need to use a slightly bigger pot than that. There's quite a lot of roots here when you put all three of them together. It's fairly rooty. Yeah, I reckon that will be right. I'm going to get a little bit of soil into the bottom of the pole if I possibly can and then pop the cuttings in. And this is exciting because I currently don't feel like I've got a varicosum anymore because it's been in the pot box for such a long time so I'm going to be really excited to feel like I've got this plant back in my collection and hopefully this time it does better. If anyone's got any varicosum tips then please do let me know. I think I just need to be much more vigilant with my pest checking and just keep lots of predatory mite sachets all over it and hope that I don't have any pesty issues again. Also, the reason I said about before about it being a purebred plant or not a hybrid is just because I've obviously got the Philodendron Splendid, which is a Melanochrysum Varicosum hybrid. And that plant for me has been ridiculously easy. I haven't had to worry about pests. It hasn't given me any of the issues that the Varicosum previously gave me. And it is half Varicosum, so you'd kind of expect that it would. But apparently plants that are hybrids, that are crosses of two separate things, often have a lot more resilience to disease, which kind of makes sense. It's kind of like if you get a crossbred dog instead of a pure breed. Crossbreeds tend to have more resilience to certain things. That's my way of thinking of it anyway. So yeah, and again, I've got, oh, I've got a couple of these little hairpins left. So I'm going to use them again to just hold the stem against the pole and encourage the aerial roots in. This is going to be much easier to do once the pole's had a rehydrate because it is quite dry at the moment. And one of you asked, do you put your propagation box in brackets sticks in light as well as on heat? I'm not sure I fully understand that question. Um, but the bit I don't understand is the sticks. Uh, but so I, I don't, on the whole, I have I have done before, but on the whole I don't use, or I'm not currently using heat mats for my propagation boxes, um, mainly just because it is so warm in my flat, I definitely haven't needed to, um, but I absolutely do use grow lights. You don't have to use grow lights if you've got the space to be able to keep your prop boxes somewhere with natural light, and obviously they've got a transparent lid, then you can absolutely do it that way. Um, but no, I do use grow lights for my prop boxes just because I've set up a little propagation zone in my bedroom and I've got grow lights there and that is currently where I keep all of my prop boxes. But no, heat mats as well, heat mats can be fantastic. They are a great way of speeding up propagation because on the whole, heat, light and humidity, depending on the plant obviously, but with most tropical plants, heat, light and humidity just help to speed everything along. There we go, perfect. So that is, I know all its leaves are facing weird directions at the moment, but once it faces the light, it should straighten out fairly quickly. That is my, the start of my new varicosum plant and I'm really excited for it. Please do keep your fingers crossed because I'd be so happy if this one did well. But yeah, those are, those are all the ones that I brought across. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna go back to my watering station by the sink and I'm gonna give these a water through. In fact, in fact, I'm gonna quickly take these two through to the bathroom and rehydrate their moss poles. And then I'm gonna water the Wilbur Graves and fill the reservoirs of my little anthurium babies. I spoke about this in my last video, but if the moss is very dry and it hasn't had a water through in a while, then it's probably gonna be quite hydrophobic. So what you'll probably want to do is either spray it before you water or let the water kind of run through it give it five minutes or so and then come back to it and then it should absorb a lot quicker. Oh yeah, I can see my white princess cuts are already starting to callus over, which is really, really good. That means by tomorrow, almost certainly they'll be ready to be propagated to go into the propagation medium. Oh my goodness. 
just going to put them in a safe place for the time being and then I can do the watering. Woohoo! So with the Hoya Wilbur Graves, seeing as that was in soil already and I have mixed some of its old soil through, I am going to go in with fertilised water just because I have already been fertilising this plant and it is used to that. And then with the little Anthurium clarinerviums, I'm just going to use just normal water. I could probably go in with fertilised, but seeing as I've just changed out their environment, I don't want to add in too much too soon. So I've just created a little water reservoir at the bottom. And I think I'm going to keep these ones in my cabinet because it goes without saying anything that's come out of a propagation box or these ones, even though they were just covered in cling film, they're going to be used to very high humidity levels. And as I was saying earlier about acclimating plants slowly, if I was to go and put them in a brand new environment that was very different to the one that they've been in, then chances are their success rate of doing good things for me is not going to be as great. So yeah, I think these are going to be cabinet plants for the time being. But seeing as I'm on a roll, I may as well keep going for a little bit. I mean, if you're still watching, I'm guessing you're still doing plant chores as well. So we can carry on together and motivate each other for a little while and hopefully get a little bit more done. I'm just going to leave these ones to drain and bring a few more plants over. So my Calathea orbifolia is one that in the time I've been away has suffered slightly. I mean, overall, she's looking fairly good and she is giving me some lovely new growth, but she's just a little bit brown and crispy. And this is yet another plant that I put into semi-hydro quite recently and she's responded really well. In fact, I've got all of my Calatheas in semi-hydro now and they are loving life. But she just got very very dehydrated she completely dried out in the time that i was away and my, my humidifiers weren't running the whole time as well because i couldn't put them on a timer system so this is the result it's not awful and it's definitely just an aesthetic thing but i'm gonna just give her a pest check give her leaves a wipe and i'm gonna trim back the brown bits just so that she's kind of visually looking a little bit better one of you asked, do you have experience with spontaneous variegation? My Alocasia zebrina has got it. That's amazing that it's spontaneously variegated. That does not happen often at all. Um, so I personally firsthand don't have experience with spontaneous variegation, I don't think. Um, it's something that I used to be incredibly sceptical about and I, I, I don't know why I didn't believe in it. Obviously it can happen. Um, but I've never personally had it happen to me. However, I do have a very close friend who had it happen with one of his monsteras. Uh, I, I don't think I talked about this on YouTube, but I definitely posted about it over on Instagram quite a lot. It was the weirdest thing. There was no sign in the mother plant at all of any kind of variegation. There was no white on the stem. And all of a sudden it put out a leaf that had a really big patch of white. Um, and he wasn't really that fast. Obviously, I was super, super excited about this. And I ended up taking the plant off him for, I think, about three months, just because I wanted to monitor it and I wanted to see what would happen. I wanted if maybe it was to do with disease that was acting like variegation, because that's something you do have to be a little bit careful of sometimes. Um, certain diseases like, for example, mosaic virus, that can look very much like variegation. I know commonly on the Monstera adansonii, a lot of people think they've been super lucky and they picked up a variegated one and actually it is just mosaic virus which can display as variegation but with his it actually it truly was variegated the next leaf had variegation on as well it wasn't kind of marbled variegation it was very blocky so yeah I, like it absolutely can happen i've seen it firsthand but i i don't with my own plants have any experience of it but congratulations to you i'm i'm very pleased to hear it and i only wish that one of my plants would do that if I had to pick one to do it, I think I would pick my bird of paradise because I think that would be amazing. The next question is anything that you regret in your plant journey or would do differently? Um, I think I touched on this when I was repotting actually. I think, I think probably building my collection up a little bit slower. I mean, I know that's just not in my nature. I see something, I get obsessed. I want to kind of go in at 110%, but 
although I did build my collection up over many years, I wish, I think, perhaps that I'd taken a little bit more time to get to know some of the plants in my collection before bringing in new ones because I have had some plant deaths in my time that could definitely have been prevented if I didn't have too much on my hands, if I didn't have like hundreds of others to look after. So I think if I could do things differently, that's probably what I would tell myself. Whether I would take that advice if I was listening to it back then is questionable. I'm not sure I would. But that's probably the main thing. And I and I guess, I mean, it's all a learning curve, isn't it? I was going to say, I guess I wish I'd researched my plants from the very start when I first started bringing real non-fake plants into my home. But again, if I hadn't had the failures of losing plants in the first place, then maybe I wouldn't have felt the need to. Or if everything had just kind of gone fine, maybe I wouldn't have found a passion for learning about plants. So... There's lots of things that I would have individually done differently with certain plants, I think. Like, I would have got my alocasias into semi-hydro sooner. Also, I know I sound like I'm promoting semi-hydro at the moment. I am not making any money from this. I just am I'm just passionate about it and I wish more people knew about it. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that's the thing I wish I'd known sooner. But in terms of regrets, there's nothing massive that comes to mind for me. I'm sure I have got regrets. Oh, in fact, I'm, my brain's just going down a wormhole. Things that I've done, like trials that I've done with certain plants that have failed, I probably regret trying certain things. But then again, like you, you live and you learn, don't you? I mean, I won't be trying them again with different plants. So yeah, maybe I don't have any big standout regrets. Do any of you guys, do you have any big plant regrets or things that you wish you'd done differently or anything like that. Maybe I've got loads and I'm just thinking kind of in the wrong, I'm not in the right section of my brain to register that right now. No, I, th I, th I think I'm fairly happy with how things have gone. The ups, the downs still continue to be downs. It's just part of the journey, isn't it? So yeah. How did your philodendron splendid get so big? Um, this is very similar to what I said about my pink and white princess philodendron. I think, a lot. I mean, actually more so moss pole wise with my, my philodendron splendid, but a lot of it has come down to light. Like I've got that plant currently pretty much pushed up against uh, a south facing window and I have just acclimated it to be able to take that level of light and it's done amazing things for it. But I also do know from having that plant from a cutting, this is really difficult to get under here, um, from having that plant from a cutting, the second I got it onto a well hydrated moss pole and it started to form its own root system in that, that's when I noticed a significant step up. Because I know I've seen a lot of people, a lot of people not growing that plant on a moss pole. And I don't know why, because obviously with things like the varicosum, people tend to grow that on a pole. It is a climbing plant, so I don't understand why you wouldn't with the splendid um but yeah as soon as i got it on a moss pole and got it in very good light it just started doing the most incredible things for me and even when i did the chop and extend i kind of if you didn't watch that video basically i chopped the moss pole in half without rooting the plant first but because it had a good root system already in the moss pole that essentially supported the plant for a period of time until it formed its new root system um, but i expected after doing the chop and extend for that plant to and not throw a tantrum, but I didn't expect its new leaf to be as big. I expected the growth to kind of go back a step for a little while, and it hasn't. It's just continued to size up. So, yeah, moss pole is definitely, definitely important. Good light, obviously the, the, the normal things. Good fertiliser during growing season or when the plant is actively growing. Good, uh, I was going to say good levels of humidity. It hasn't been one, in my experience, that's needed ridiculously high levels of humidity. Uh, I did make a full care video on this plant as well and how I got mine to size up too, so I will link that video down in the description box below. But no, it's it's one of my one of my favourite plants. It's kind of a constant favourite in my collection and it's one that I definitely would not part with easily. I'm so proud of it and I absolutely love it. Could you tell us Yoli's adoption story? I've definitely spoken about that on my channel before. Maybe not for a while, but... Um, I'm sure I've mentioned it before, so sorry if I'm repeating myself, but so yeah, Yoli is a Greek rescue and I've had her now for 
almost three years and um, it's actually quite a funny story. I, I won't kind of go too much into it because I know I have spoken about it before, but um, found her on the website. I absolutely loved her. I fell in love with her. It was like love at first sight. And my ex, because we got her together at the time, my ex looked at her and was like, no, not the dog for us. Don't like the look of her. Um, and so we found a couple of other dogs. Also, the floor is shaking. I think my neighbour's got her washing machine on, so I'm sorry if you feel like we're shaking right now. Um, but we looked at some other dogs on the website. We kind of agreed on a few and we inquired. And one of the other dogs was called something like Yuli or it, it began with a J and it looked a little bit like Yoli. And anyway, when we got the call from the agency, they called me during the day because I was working from home. And, um, and they said, oh, you know what? They were like, we've had interest in the other dogs, but but we really think you'd be a fantastic match for Yoli. And I was chatting away and chatting away and she sent through the full profile and I looked at the profile and I was like, oh my goodness, there's been a mix up. She thinks that we mean Yoli, the one that my ex didn't like. But then also there was a part of me that was like, maybe it's meant to be. So when he got home, I said to him, look, this is the situation. They do think we'd be a good match for Yoli. It was a genuine mistake, but we, we went with it and absolutely no regrets. Although, getting her over was very difficult because we were in i can't remember if we were actually in lockdown or that we were kind of in the breaks of lockdown and um they had to drive over to greece and ferry her over which obviously was incredibly stressful for her um but i actually wasn't around at the time she came over i this is back when i was acting i was doing a short film at the time and i was away filming and I couldn't I couldn't be there like they literally gave us a call and they and they said it's going to be Tuesday she's coming over on Tuesday it's that's all you have to wait another six months and so we thought well obviously it needs to be Tuesday we can't hold up another six months um but yeah so I couldn't be there so my ex had to go with his one of his colleagues at the time to to pick Yuli up and I didn't get to meet her for about a week and a half which Oh my goodness, was the the toughest week and a half in the world. I was getting all these photos coming through of Yoli and I was like, I, I don't know my dog yet. I obviously fell in love with her the second I met her in person. I was already in love with her without having met her, but I, yeah, I just, I was so, so happy to finally meet her. But no, I, I've, I've, I've had rescue dogs all my life. My mum's also got a Greek rescue dog. Uh, and I know a lot of people say like, why would you rescue from abroad? There's so many dogs that need homes here. And I totally agree with that. I have rescued within the UK before as well. But I think the thing that really drew me to rescuing from abroad is just the fact that a lot of the dogs over in foreign countries like Romania and Greece, because they have got so many more strays, they are not going to find homes. And they are, some of them going to be sent to kill shelters where they essentially put the animals down if they can't find a home. And obviously that just doesn't happen over here in the UK. So especially Yoli being a slightly older dog when we got her, she was already two and a half, I think. Um, they'd had no interest at all in Yoli and I don't know if she would have ever found a home. So it feels like for me, it felt like the right thing to do. But I think in general, I've got obviously nothing against people that go to reliable breeders and get get their dogs that way but I like to think I'd always rescue just for that reason um, although if, I must say it must be quite nice as well to have a well-behaved dog and you know their history and they don't come with baggage that must be quite nice because Yoli is a sweetie at home um, but she is a wee bit of a challenge dog out and about <laughs> I say wee bit of a challenge dog she has got a lot better but um, tends to kind of launch herself for other dogs, other people. It, she's, she's a handful, but as I say, she is getting better. She knows we're talking about her. Her ears have just pricked up. You could go. He said you could go. Oh, sure. The next question was, have you ever put plants outside for the summer? Um, <laughs> I made a video about this very recently about the importance of acclimating your plants to the outside weather because I had some serious drama recently. I burnt my bird of paradise and my big, my, my big beautiful monstera and I, I still don't know what to do about them because they've got the horrible burn marks across their leaves but particularly with my big monstera she's got her gorgeous form and I don't want to chop her back. 
I'm going off topic, but yes, I have put my plants outside. I would do it again, but I would acclimate slower. Similarly to what I said about plants and lighting conditions when you get them from different places about inquiring and letting them adjust slowly. Uh, yes, I, I should have done that. I should have taken my own advice, but I did not build it up as slowly as I should have done. And now I'm suffering the consequences. But yeah, I know I've kind of jokingly said a few times now, I've said it a few times that with, hang on, I'll bring her over so you can see her. Yeah, this is my big monstera. And as you can see, properly, properly burnt, like those sections, the whole leaf isn't dead, but there's sections on there that are just like crispy, like paper. And I could chop them back, but then I just love the shape of the leaf. So yeah, I've jokingly said a few times and I'm actually starting to convince myself that it might be a good idea. Please either talk me out of it or talk me into it. But I've thought about getting like a non-toxic watercolour paint. I know this sounds ridiculous. It sounds ridiculous. Um, but going over just the dead parts of the leaves, like the crispy brown papery bits and making them green again so that I can still look at the plant and appreciate its form because obviously that's not going to do the plant any damage it's just going to mean that visually it looks a little bit nicer i can't believe i just said that i know it's i know it's a really really silly idea i feel embarrassed saying it but yeah that's kind of what i'm thinking and i might do it but if you don't want to do that just make sure if you are going to put your plants outside Make the transition a slow and steady one so that you are not having to think about watercolour in your plants. Okay, so I've chopped back the brown crispy edges and she's looking a lot better. I am just going to give her leaves a wipe over. I know, again, the chopping of the brown bits is just an aesthetic thing. You don't have to do it, but I, I personally just think it makes the plant look healthier. And she is actually in a pretty good state, all things considered. Like, she has got lots of, lots of gorgeous new growth coming up, actually. Yeah, and I've just given her a good check for pests, and she's not pesty, which is good. These ones are a magnet for spider mites, calatheas, and touch wood, I haven't had any issues since I've moved in here with calatheas and spider mites so i'm really really happy about that long may that last but the next question was any wishlist plants that seem unattainable um as i said earlier the piper sp thailand silver to me seems unattainable just because i've only ever seen it in grow tropicals i haven't seen that plant anywhere else um grow tropicals don't have it in stock anymore either so it feels quite unattainable um, and another one that I really, really want, but the price on it is still absolutely ridiculous, um, is a variegated philodendron biliettio. I just think they are stunning. And the last time I looked, I think it was on Aroid Market's website. They had a very small plant on there for about £3,000. And I don't know about you guys, I'm not in the position to be spending £3,000 on anything, let alone a small variegated plant. So currently... That is very unattainable. Um, who knows, maybe prices will drop in the future. Maybe things will come down. Maybe I won't want that plant by that point. But yeah, I think that's just something as well about when someone says, oh, well, when I tell myself I can't have it, it just, I know it's such a childish mindset, but it just kind of stays on your mind a little bit more. And I do think about that plant quite a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, currently, currently it's not one that I'm going to be able to get. And then someone also asked, how have you found using Soil Ninja's Pon over Lechuza? I've just switched and my plants love it. Um, so to be completely honest, I, so when I first tried Pon, which was a couple of years ago now, I ordered two what I thought were small bags of Lechuza Pon and they turned out to be ones that were about that size and they have lasted me a very long time. So I haven't really needed to try any other any other kind of I know soil ninjas isn't actually pon it's just semi hydro mix that is very similar to pon um but I've only started using the soil ninja stuff very recently and when I say very very recently I mean literally in the last few weeks um so it's too soon to tell for me personally but I I love soil ninjas products I I use that I've used their soils for I mean god 
well over a year. I, I love their moss. I'm pretty certain I'm going to get on very well with it, but currently I don't think I'm in the position to be able to compare my experience with Lechuza Pond to their Semi Hydro. Um, but I'm glad that you're getting on well with that. I'm sure, as I say, I'm sure I will as well. The thing that I really like about soil ninjas is that they don't add um, slow release fertilizer into it in the same way that Lechu uh, yeah, Lechuza do. Um, I know for some people having slow release fertilizer kind of pre-added is, is easier because you don't have to worry about fertilizing. But as I say, I'm so in love with the fertilizer that I use. I like to be able to still use that on my plants. So yeah, whereas with my ones in Lechuza Pond, I don't really fertilize them that much just because I don't want to overdo it when they've already got stuff added in to the substrate. And the next one is how do you care for your variegated fry deck compared to your regular fry deck? There are definitely some differences, but I'm not going to go through all of them now just because I have got a care video on this plant coming in the next week from this video going up. Um, so if you have got that plant and you're wondering about how to care for it, then hopefully I will answer all of your questions in that. So yes, I won't give too much away now, not that it's like some big secret, but I, I guess I guess the main thing, if I had to give one thing, is lighting. Lighting, for me, I found is very different between the standard Michelinziana and the variegated fry deck. But yes, stay tuned for a care video. <laughs> Cool, okay, she is clean, she is conditioned, and she is looking beautiful. I love the Orbifolia so much. I know it's a, a more kind of common house plant, but it is one of my all-time favorites. I feel like I don't take enough time to appreciate this plant. It's just got the most beautiful foliage. I think it's so gorgeous. So yeah, cool, right, that was the big one, the big job ticked off. Not exactly big job, but you know what I mean, just finicky, lots of lots of things to do, lots of bits to go through and chop and and whatnot. Um, and this is my Philodendron Golden Dragon, and I've got this one again into semi-hydro recently. Um, I'm pretty sure, just taking off a caterpillar, um, I'm pretty sure that it's water reservoir. Yep, it's gone because I haven't filled it since I've been home. I will just fill it up and then just give it a quick wipe over. I have had such a funny relationship with this plant. I loved it when I first got it. I got it just over a year ago. I think I think it was an import from Green Spaces ID. I did I did do an unboxing video on it and I really liked it when I first got it and then very quickly I completely fell out of love with it. I chopped a load of it up, I sent out some cuttings. I was very casually just sending out cuttings to anybody that asked pretty much and then the plant started to regrow and I don't know, I don't know what it was about it but as the plant started to regrow it was regrowing in a very different way and I loved the way that it was growing. Like I think before it was looking a little bit almost like that leaf there. Let me bring it up closer, Jay. Do you see what I mean? A little bit kind of like, I don't know, beaten up looking and it just wasn't looking that healthy. And I just kind of assumed that that's what the plant looks like. And I was like, no, it's not for me. Um, but yeah, then when it started to regrow, it was beautiful and conditioned and shiny. And I just fell in love with it again. So yeah, and I did also have a moment about three months ago where I thought to myself should I should I get rid of it just when I was trying to have a little bit of, de of a declutter of my collection um, I did wonder if it was one that I could part ways with because I hadn't always loved it but the thought of getting rid of it just makes me it makes me sad so I haven't done it and also it is one of the lowest maintenance lowest maintenance philodendrons but lowest maintenance plants in my collection I don't think it's ever really given me any grief uh, as I say, its reservoir was just completely bone dry for, I don't know, probably like a week and it still looks lovely, it's still putting out new growth. So if you want a really gorgeous philodendron that looks very glossy and luxurious but you don't want to, it's a bad thing to say, but you don't want to put in the work, then maybe this is one for you. But yeah, that was a very quick whiz over, but look how gorgeous it is also. Just look how perfect that leaf is. It's so ruffly and 
beautiful and I feel like this is a perfect light to show you it in as well because it's just catching the light at all different angles I think it's just a gorgeous plant so yeah and then I brought over two more this is my Peperomia Ice Queen and this one is actually doing okay this is one of the ones that I talked about in my struggles video recently because I lost a massive section of growth on it before I before I after I got home um, because it had just dried out so much. I can see again now it is very dry, so I'm gonna give it a water. Um, and I was gonna say give its leaves a wipe over. I did give it a dust not that long ago and it's actually looking okay. So I think with this one, I might just get away with the water. And I have put some sections of it into my prop box as well, some bits that died back. So I'm hoping that at some point I'll be able to pop them all back up together again and get a lovely full plant going because it was beautiful and full up until recently. I just love everything about this plant. I think the colour of it is amazing. I think the, like the texture, the shininess, it's very similar to the watermelon peperomia but obviously hasn't got the dark kind of watermelon-y stripes going down it. Yeah, just look at those leaves. They're almost like mirrors. I know it's a strange thing to say because they are not reflective, <laughs> but you know what I mean? There's just something about them that you could almost, I don't know what I'm saying. I, I know what I mean. A lot of the time I know what I mean and other people don't. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then finally, I think this is gonna be finally, just because I'm aware, oh, I've got another one here as well. Okay, two more. I was gonna say I'm aware that this is probably a very long video. I'm not quite sure how long this will come out at, but I'm thinking probably at least an hour or two. So it's almost dinner time here as well. I feel like this is a nice way to wind down. A few more plants. Um, but yeah, this one has just got, it's got a few leaves that I'm just going to trim back that are not looking fantastic like that little one there. And it is also, I mean, it's flowers are dead. I do tend to chop the flowers off aglaonema. I should really play about with cross-pollination, but it's something in this type of plant that I've I've never tried. And I often just find that like if you don't plan to pollinate a plant and you still let it bloom, sometimes that can just take a lot of the energy that could be otherwise pushed into growth. So I tend to chop the flowers back. But yeah, actually, maybe I will, because they're, they're all blooming like crazy at the moment. Maybe I will try cross-pollination. I would love to be able to cross this one with like, I don't know, my silver queen or something. I think that would look incredible. Like the pattern on the leaves with the bluey silveriness. I think that would be just gorgeous. The next question was, what's your current favorite plants? Always a difficult one to pick just one, but I would probably say right now, besides the obvious one, um, my variegated fry deck, uh, I would probably say my Anthurium Warocquianum because if you watched my last video you will have seen the most beautiful leaf that she's given me and I feel like I have just waited such a long time for a leaf like that. So yeah, if I had to pick just one, I'd probably say my Warocquianum. Although I've got others that are just like constant favourites, like my, my Bird of Paradise is always a favourite of mine, my Burnt Monstera. It's always a favourite, although I just feel very sad looking at her now. But yes, I'm going to go with the Brocianum. What inspired you to have so many houseplants? I feel like I pretty much covered this earlier. I think, besides the fact that I do have a very addictive personality, I think knowing what a payoff it has on my mental health, I just want to be doing plant care a lot of the time. It makes me really, really happy. It is my way of tuning into nature, it is my way of bringing me back to myself when I'm feeling angsty. And if you don't have a lot of plants, quite a lot of the time you often run out of things to do. So yeah, it's it's kind of just been also like a challenge to myself, I think having lots of plants, although yes, sometimes the challenge does get to a point of burnout or complete overwhelmingness. I like on the whole being able to feel a sense of accomplishment from watching my plants thrive and knowing knowing that I'm doing it. It's a sense of achievement, really. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably alongside lots of other reasons, but those are the main ones that come to mind. And I can't, I can't see myself massively downsizing my collection anytime soon. 
Um, I have had moments of wanting to clear a little bit of space. I took quite a lot to, actually, that's a lie. I didn't take quite a lot to the recent plant swap. I was going to take more, but I was disorganized. Um, I have got rid of quite a few plants recently. So yeah, is that a mealybug? No, it's just a piece of fluff. Oh God, I am so pent up about mealybugs at the moment, having found them on my Hoya. I got distracted um but no that is that is why i have so many house plants also because i just don't feel like my home is my home if i don't have plants everywhere like it, like i said about my bathroom i walk into my bathroom and although i try and keep it nice in there it doesn't really feel like my space because it's not full of plants um, and i could absolutely try the fake plant thing maybe i will i'm, I'm not saying that i wouldn't but it just wouldn't feel alive for me I don't think that's only because of my passion for actual house plants. I think maybe if you haven't had house plants and you just liked the look of fake ones, then maybe you wouldn't get the same sense. I never used to, to be honest. When I used to just have fake plants before I got into house plants, I never, I, I just really liked them. They were, kind of, ooh. <laughs> they were just kind of part of the scenery. It was more of kind of like an interior design thing. And I've got quite a few questions left, so I'm going to try and get through as many as I can as I clean the leaves of this very small little philodendron silver sword. Um, but the next one was, how does a planted cutting, how, sorry, how big does a planter cutting need to be before you can chop and prop to make a plant bigger? Um, I mean, there's really no rule on it. I think so long as your plant, the, the mother plant, has a well-established root system, it can have it can have two leaves it can have three leaves if you want to start chopping and propping it's not usually going to kill your plant so long as that plant is healthy like for example this is quite a well actually it's not anymore it's got quite big um but this i've had since it was just one leaf and when it got to three leaves i could have easily taken a top cutting of it and and carried on i could have propagated it i could have potted it back up with this one once it was rooted yeah, I think if you've got if you've got a very, very juvenile plant, then obviously do be wary about chopping and propping too much. But I think so long as your plant is relatively well established and there's no issues with it, then I would say tread carefully, but but go for it, do the chop. And then the next one was, have you ever used Hoya nectar as a syrup or even tried it before? I have not done that. I would like to know more about that. I'm guessing you collect it from the flowers, but I don't know how you'd get that much. How does that work? Please let me know in the comments below because I'd be really intrigued about that. Obviously Hoyas are non-toxic, so I can imagine, and also their blooms smell amazing. So I can imagine that being really quite delicious. Yeah, I would love to know more about that. Please do let me know. Secret to keeping alocasia alive semi-hydro again i know i'm talking about it constantly at the moment but as i keep saying it's something i wish i knew about sooner let's choose a pond semi-hydro in general i mean when i say semi-hydro i'm referring to like semi-hydro as in soil ninja semi-hydro mix i wouldn't personally go in with something like lecker um i have grown alocasia and perlite before but again it contains no nutritional value so you need to make sure that you're fertilizing and everything but yeah, semi-hydro, good lights, good levels of humidity. And that is pretty much, very, like very briefly, the gist, I would say. Um, but I have just finished and I've got, I've just got a few more questions. So you know what, I'm going to do one more plant. I'm going to do one more plant. This is the Caladium lindenii that I got on one of my recent houseplant tour episodes when me and Ross went to Hugo and Green. I've had lots of name suggestions from you guys in the comments. Ross is still referring to it as Ursula. Some, one, someone said Calvin, and I'm kind of loving Calvin. So, yeah, I'd say still undecided, but, um, but yeah, I like, I like Calvin. Um, but it's given me quite a lot of new growth, actually, since we filmed that video. It's had several new leaves pop up. Um, but it's got one here that I've been looking at and again it's just an aesthetic thing but I'm just going to trim back a little bit of the brown and I'm just going to give it a little wipe over whilst answering the next question. 
Somebody said, I'd love to see your mum's garden and how many house plants she has. I have spoken to my mum about this recently because I know some of you were saying that you'd love to see her garden. She's totally up for it. She would love to do it. So that will potentially be coming soon. Uh, and then someone said, how old is your oldest plant? And I was thinking about this recently, actually. I think my oldest plant, in fact, my oldest plant is right here next to me. Um, I think it's about five and a half years old now and you wouldn't believe it from looking at it it's my alocasia portadora because obviously it's only got two leaves that they have sized up dramatically since i replanted her but i completely chopped that plant up um just before i moved in here actually when i was still at my mum's just because i was struggling with pests so much on it uh, so i chopped it back to just pure bulbs i guess you would say and i overwintered them and then I gave two of them away because there were three in the pot. I gave one to Sarah, the plant rescuer, and I gave one to Emma, good growing. Uh, and I kept one back for myself and that's what she's looking like now. So although she doesn't look as well established as you might think for a plant that I've had for such a long time, she's, yeah. She, I've, I've obviously had plants before that, but I think, that's a missing one. I think that's the one that has been in my collection the longest that hasn't died or been passed along to a new home. Maybe quite, I've got loads of poppers plants. I'm kind of thinking maybe this one is an original. Maybe that one's been in my collection for a bit longer, but I'm not sure. No, Alocasia Portadora is number one, but oh my goodness, it is a magnet for pests. It is ridiculous. There's a few non-plant related ones that I'm gonna skip just for the time being because I want to answer the planty questions. Um, but to the person who asked, Team Oppenheimer. The next one is my Hoya hasn't had any new growth since I got it a couple of months ago. Any tips? Uh, some Hoyas are just really, really slow to grow. Like my Hoya Latifolia Sarabac that I showed you earlier, the big magnificent one. That one's given me one leaf in over a year. Some Hoyas are just ridiculously slow. Um, but if you want to increase the chance of it giving you kind of lots a lot quicker, obviously making sure it's got good light, good humidity as well, something that you might not think Hoyas would respond particularly well to, but they do, they don't need humidity, but they love humidity. And the main thing is warmth as well. A lot of my Hoyas that I've got in my cabinet are growing like crazy. Ones that I previously had in just like normal room conditions since I've had them in my cabinet, they've been doing the most amazing things. So yeah, I would say heat is probably, heat and light are probably two of the main tricks to fast growth in Hoyas. You could also try just covering it in like, like I did with my fern, like a hummus tub or putting it into a prop box or something like that to kind of help kickstart it a little bit. That's what I would probably do. Do you think you'll ever like Syngonium again? It's not that I don't like Syngonium, I can still really appreciate them in other people's collections and in fact I saw a Syngonium, I can't remember what it was, but I saw one pop up on Etsy when I was just browsing plants the other day and it was so beautiful and I did think to myself, should I get a cutting? Um, and I've got the Syngonium that I think is a Syngonium Frosted Heart that Emma gave me and it doesn't look Syngonium-y and I absolutely love it. It doesn't have the arrowheads shape it's got more more of a heart shape but yeah it's not that as i say it's not that i don't like them it's just that i i wasn't getting that much joy out of out of growing them anymore so i passed them along to other homes the ones that i had not because i just not because i didn't like them as i say it was just because they weren't ticking boxes for me at the moment but yeah absolutely i think i could fall in love with syngonium again i think i could bring more into my collection um, it's just that there hasn't been one recently that has grabbed me enough to make me do that. What is your favourite method of propagation? It really depends on the plant, to be honest. I think this time last year I probably would have said 100% sphagnum moss all the way for most plants. I've got much better at propagating in soil for succulents now. That's something that I was really scared of before. I hated soil propagation. Obviously, it doesn't work for all plants, but I've got much better at that. Um, 
I'm also trying pawn propagation, like something that I, this is a very recent thing, I've just created a pawn prop box and things in there seem to be doing really well and that's something that previously I would never have thought to do. Um, perlite, I, I, oh, I don't know, it really depends on the plant. Water as well. <laughs> I'm being incredibly indecisive. Okay, so for for vining philodendron, oh like, okay, epipremnum, get my words out, epipremnum I would personally pretty much always do in water, um, water or moss I would be my go-tos, but primarily water. My more unusual temperamental types of philodendron, I would almost always use moss, sphagnum moss, um, and that goes for Monstera as well, I would, I would tend to stick towards moss. Um, whereas with alocasia, for example, if I'm trying to root alocasia corms, I do, actually I've kind of switched more to soil recently, uh, but I used to just purely do perlite. So it really does depend, depend on what you're propagating, but yeah, I just, I, I always go with my gut and it's not always right, but 99% of the time it is right. So I think if you're struggling to decide, just go with your gut. But yeah, those are, I, I don't think I can drag out wiping this plant anymore and I'm getting hungry. So I'm going to finish this video here. Um, but if you liked this kind of long chatty style video, I'll happily do more like this. I've got lots more plant chores to be doing. So yeah, let me know in the comments and we can do this again because I love making videos like this. I find it a lot of fun. But yeah, I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, have a lovely day and I will see you in the next video. Stay sexy, plant lovers.